The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nova Scotia Tr Health Trauma Program Interprofessional Clinical Webinar. My name is Andrea Bond, and I am the Trauma Coordinator's Education Coordinator and will be the moderator for today's webinar. We are pleased to have Dr. Jay Manna joining us from Moncton, New Brunswick, as today's presenter. Dr. Manna is based out of Moncton, where her roles include hematopath hematopathologist for Horizon Health, <laughs> Medical Director for Hematology Lab in Transfusion Medicine. As well, Dr. Mana is the Transfusion Chair for the Regional and Provincial Transfusion Committees and a Clinical Assistant Professor with Dalhousie and Memorial Universities. The title of Dr. Mana's presentation today is Updated Provincial Massive Transfusion Protocol, MTP, the why and hows of MTPs. With the exception of the presenter, all those signed into the webinar have been muted. There will be an opportunity for questions from attendees at the end of the presentation. Please type your questions into the question section that you should see located in the top right of your screen. At the end of the presentation, I will read the questions to Dr. Mana for consideration and comments. Dr. Mana, thank you for joining us today, and you may start your presentation now. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you everybody for this opportunity to share pearls of transfusion wisdom. I've picked up these pearls through my own experiences in transfusion medicine, but also through mentors and healthcare staff uh, that I've worked with in three different provinces over almost two decades. Um, and I also want to mention that as an uh, problem solver and creative at heart, um, my excellent team and myself, we started to renovate um, our local MTP, Massive Transfusion Protocol, uh, to help improve it and make it more practical. And that extended into helping update the provincial MTP. And uh, recently, the, our New Brunswick trauma team invited me to talk about MTPs in general um, in January. And I believe some of some of you had attended that. Anyways, I mention it because there were excellent thought-provoking questions during that talk, and that uh, prompted me to afterwards uh, look more deeply into the management of critical bleeds. Uh, so I was reading about critical bleed management uh, from a historical perspective in the military, in the civilian setting, um, and globally. And what I've done for this talk, as you can see, I, I, I have um, changed the, the title um, to an MTP review, the changes and constants, but essentially it's the heart of it is the same talk in January. Um, however, I've also added um, some of the concepts I gleaned from my recent readings of uh, critical bleed management in, in general, as well as uh, some ideas for the future um, uh, for the future of critical bleed management in Canada. And so moving on to the next slide. So this is my menu or the objectives. What I want to review. Oh. All right. I think the slide will stay put. So what I would like to review is why the MTP was devised in the first place and why it's needed, and then to understand the underlying principles and ethical goals um, of the MTP. So to me, I see principles as uh, basically the constants. It's, it's the skeleton upon which a lot of the, the theory is based. Um, and then move on to the tools. And these are tools that enable application of theory to practice. And I've summarized that as the six T's, so we will go over those. And then lastly, I will discuss some of the challenges and limitations of MTP. So it in itself is a very good protocol, but like anything in medicine, there's, there's pros and cons. So we'll discuss the challenges and limitations. And this is where I will incorporate my recent readings about critical bleed management and some ideas about uh, how we could potentially um, improve critical management um, in Canada. And in terms of disclosures, I have none. So let's start with MTP. MTP stands for Massive Transfusion Protocol. 
it's synonymous and exactly the same as MHP, which is massive hemorrhage uh, protocol. And they, they are the same thing. In some provinces, it's MHP that's used. In other provinces, it's MTP. So it is semantics. Um, to me personally, I do prefer massive hemorrhage protocol. Um, I feel it has a more holistic connotation. Anyways, so why was the MTP required in the first place? It was in fact mandated in every province across Canada about a decade ago. And uh, I did help to implement this in BC where I had worked as a hematopathologist for about 12 years. So I was involved in helping to implement um, the MTP there. Um, but the main reason it was mandated is because it has been shown to decrease morbidity and mor morbidity, uh, mortality um, of very critically bleeding patients. And the way this is achieved, so the goal is to be able to provide the appropriate amounts and types of blood products uh, for patients who are undergoing um, massive hemorrhage. Uh, and they may have a DIC, which is disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, um, simultaneously going on with the bleed and it in fact exacerbates the bleed. So this, this goal is achieved by linking uh, lab tests. So these particular lab test results then help to guide the use of particular blood products. So that's what the MTP um, helps to do is to link the lab tests and then tailor the blood products. And that's one of the major uh, logistics of it. And what do these lab tests uh, tell us? Well, one of the most important thing is right off the bat, if there is a underlying coagulopathy or DIC, so that's the disseminated intravascular coagul coagulopathy present. And just a reminder, um, DIC is secondary. It's a secondary imbalance of the coagulation system and any major medical illness can lead to that. So any major anaphylaxis, obstetric complications, trauma, um, sepsis, for instance, um, it can throw out, throw off the coagulation system and lead to DIC. And what happens is there's consumption of coagulation factors as well as platelets. And of course, these are the very elements that are needed to stop bleeding. So we are consuming those elements and therefore it can exacerbate the bleed. The other thing that the lab test can tell us about is once a transfusion is given, so once packed cells are given, and there are so many packed cells, so eight to 10 units, for example, it can start to dilute out a person's own platelets and coagulation factors. So this is after a massive transfusion. So uh, ongoing lab testing in the MTP helps to determine if those um, elements are being diluted. So you, those elements that are needed for um, stopping bleeding, um, they can be consumed in DIC or they can be diluted by a massive transfusion. So it guides as to whether we need more platelets or FFP in order to replace the coagulation factors and platelets. Uh, and so the blood products that are used to help stop a massive bleed are red cells, FFP is fresh frozen plasma, um, so plasma is flash frozen, um, kept at about minus 30, minus 40 degrees, and it can be kept like that for about a year to a year and a half. Um, platelets, platelets are a fresh product, um, and it's centrifuged from whole blood. It's kept at room temperature, and its shelf life is only five to seven days, so a very short uh, shelf life. So these are what I refer to as the more fresh products, are red cells, FFP, and platelets. Then there's cryo, which is a short for cryoprecipitate, and it's basically um, plasma that's flash frozen, and the components that precipitate out are mainly fibrinogen, but there's also factor 13, von Willebrand's factor, factor eight, but cryoprecipitate is mainly used for the fibrinogen um, component. There is a relatively newer product that uh, CBS um, has available. It's called fibrinogen. It's a fibrinogen concentrate. Um, so it's a more refined product than um, cryoprecipitate. Uh, it's been out for, I believe, about five to seven years now. Um, 
and it is made from thousands of uh, plasma donors. Um, it's fractionated. So this particular protein, it's fractionated, selected out, uh, purified, and then dried. Um, the other word for dried is lyophilized. So it's a fractionated lyophilized product. So these are the products that are available from the blood, pe blood bank in order to help um, manage a critical bleed. And I've written down here that timing and communication are absolutely key um, for the imp implementation of an MTP and with any kind of acute uh, situations, as you know. And just a little bit about the ethical goals and the principles underlying it. Um, so like with any management in medicine, it's basically to maximize the benefit, um, benefit to risk ratio. So it's maximizing the benefits and minimizing the risks um, to the patient. And this is in the setting of having limited blood products. So it makes it uh, more challenging. So the benefit, of course, is to be able to issue appropriate, life, potentially life-saving blood products to the patient. However, the drawbacks or the risks um, include uh, two items. One is um, there's a risk of wasting products um, like FFP and platelets. And this, of course, takes away this product from other patients who may need it even more. Uh, and that's one of the challenges of having um, limited blood products is, is trying to use it appropriately and in the setting of um, just uh, very limited uh, availabil availability. So there's two ethical considerations. The waste of product um, basically is a, a consideration of the donors. So uh, we try and minimize the waste because it's in responsibility to the donors who are taking the time and resources to donate these products. So it's not a synthetic product where we can manufacture um, great amounts of it. Um, but the other big ethical aspect is that we don't want to be taking away needed product from other patients. And this follows the ethical principles of justice. Um, so there's four deontological ethical principles, and one of them is the principle of justice. Uh, oh, sorry, every time I move my mouse, it seems to change the slides. Uh, the other risk is of, of course, transfusion reactions um, for the patient. So some of the uh, transfusion reactions include making alloantibodies, um, hemolysis, febrile reactions, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we balance the benefits and the risks? And the, the way we can balance this is through linking the lab test results with tailoring the blood products. So with MTPs, there's an initial set of lab tests. So there's this initial set, we don't necessarily, um, sorry, I was trying to use my mouse to point, but I think I'm just going, oh, there we go. I'm not sure if you can see that. But the initial lab tests are not necessarily ones that we keep doing throughout the MTP. Um, but they include doing a CBC, PTT, INR, and fibrinogen. The CBC will allow us to know the hemoglobin and the degree of anemia if it's present, um, as well as the platelet level. So knowing the platelets, uh, what's happening with PTT, INR, and fibrinogen will let us know um, off the bat if there is a simultaneous DIC or a coagulopathy going on. So remember with a coagulopathy, we, we are consuming platelets, so platelets will drop. We also consume all the different coagulation uh, factors, so both PTT and INR will increase. And in DIC, fibrinogen actually takes a nosedive much faster than other um, coagulation factors. So fibrinogen is measured di directly, and you'll see a, an acute drop in fibrinogen. Um, and uh, I believe the reason why we see far more of a drop in fibrinogen is because there are two things going on. There's a consumption of fibrinogen, but there's also fibrinolysis. So there's a breakdown um, of fibrinogen going on in a coagulopathy. 
And of course, all of that will exacerbate a bleed if, it's, if a coagulopathy is present. Uh, a group and screen is done as part of the initial lab tests. Um, and this is to help tailor um, to the, a person's blood group. And it's also to evaluate if there's any underlying alloantibodies. And if a person already has an antibody present, um, that can lead to um, an instant hemolysis right away. So it's, uh, it's to determine all sorts of different things, mainly the blood group and if there are any other antibodies. And there are tests to see if there's acidosis present. And just a reminder that in a uh, massive bleed, there's de decreased perfusion to the organs. And so there's a switch from aerobic met metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. And when that switch happens um, through the glycolo glycolytic pathway, there's a production of lactic acid, and that's how you can get acidosis occurring. Um, so just a step back and a reminder that there is a potentially lethal triad um, in traumas, as you, as you all are aware, and that is the lethal triad is coagulopathy, acidosis, and hypothermia. So once those set in, it's a much higher risk of mortality. And then there's the ongoing lab tests. And so these are done every 30 minutes um, once an MTP is triggered. So once it's triggered, there's an initial uh, set of lab tests, then every 30 minutes. And this is to monitor. And I've mentioned down here, we're monitoring basically, is there any uh, onset or continuation of DIC? but we're also seeing if there's dilution of platelets and coagulation factors. So again, the CBC, PTT, INR, fibrinogen help to determine all of those. Uh, the lactate and bicarbonate, again, these are means to monitor acidosis um, and also calcium is monitored. And the major reason is because blood products, one of the preservatives in, it, in blood products um, is citrate and citrate chelates calcium and once you have hypocalcemia set in, that will render platelets and coagulation factors more dysfunctional. So again, we don't want to exacerbate the bleed by making the elements of clotting more dysfunctional. So moving to the next slide. Um, before I launch into the six T's or how we actually implement an MTP, uh, one of the big things, the questions is when to activate an MTP. And I, I basically advise that it, it's easy to activate the MTP and it's also easy to deactivate the MTP. So if you're uncertain, um, you can always activate and then deactivate um, if, if necessary. There are different definitions of massive bleeding, um, but of course, uh, in reality, a lot of these uh, definitions are in retrospect. So in other words, it's over four hours or over three hours, or it's a rate. So it's requiring measuring time and you know, time can be of essence. So in some of the provinces, um, what's written as part of MTP as to when to trigger it is a more holistic approach. So uncontrolled bleeding um, or shock, and then an MTP can be um, activated or triggered. And I will go over uh, what happens once it's activated, but I also wanted to mention down here, um, these are some of the typical situations uh, which uh, MTPs are activated. Uh, so in, in of course, trauma, um, critical uh, bleed situations. Uh, cardiovascular settings include ruptured aortic aneurysms. GI bleeds are more specifically acute upper GI bleeds. They tend to be far worse. Um, and then of course, postpartum complications such as uh, placental abruption. So these are just examples. It's not limited, of course, to, to these situations, but this is where we have seen MTPs occurring more often. So what are the six T's? Um, basically, the first three T's are, are more active, and the, the, the third set of T's are more inherent or after an MTP. So the active ones are actively triggering it, and I will go into more details about uh, all of these. But once it's triggered, what happens? Um, then there's treatment side. So of course, the treatment. Uh, 
includes addressing the bleed. Um, so blood products are sent down right away. Um, meds is to help me remember that there are there may be anticoagulants aboard, which need to be reversed. TXA stands for transoxemic acid. Um, that's an antifibrinolytic. Um, so that can also be given. Um, so this is all to help uh, ma initially manage a critical bleed. Temperature is to make sure that temperatures don't fall below uh, 37 degrees, because remember hypothermia is part of that potentially lethal triad. And of course, pH monitoring pH is um, to see if there's acidosis and to manage that, also part of the lethal triad. So acidosis, hypothermia, and coagulopathy. Um, that's that uh, potentially critical triad. And then, of course, um, monitoring cal calcium levels because citrate can chelate calcium and that can exacerbate a bleed. So that's part of treat uh, treatment. Um, testing. This is what I had uh, mentioned earlier. There's a, a set of initial tests that are done, and then the tests continue every 30 minutes. And this is Part, automatically part of an MTP. And the main thing about the test is to help tailor the, the transfusions. Uh, the team, the team effort is all to do with timeliness and communication. It sounds simple, but of course, during um, chaos and when time is of essence, it can be uh, quite difficult to implement. I've written here having a runner. Um, I've noticed in various provinces that's one of the big issues is to have um, a, a runner. So basically a designated runner is somebody, one person who takes the blood samples up to the lab and also brings back the necessary blood products back um, to the clinical um, area. And again, when an MTP is called, um, something that seems simple, um, but having somebody designated at a runner on the spot can actually add to the confusion. So anyways, that's an example of something that's seemingly easy, but can be harder to, to manifest. Um, terminate is exactly that, is to remember to deactivate the MTP or else every 30 minutes, the, the um, test results um, keep coming in and blood pro certain blood products can be sent automatically. Um, and then T is tracking. So basically this is to uh, um, a means to assess the MTP afterwards. You know, what worked, what didn't work, where can, where can it be improved? So just fleshing out the details a little bit more about the, the six Ts. Um, so when an MTP is activated, i.e. triggered, um, I see this as um, a speed bump. So a speed bump of products are sent right away. Um, four unmatched pack cells can be issued instantly from the blood bank. Um, however, other blood products um, like FFP, they need to be thawed. So um, two, generally in most blood, blood banks, two units um, of FFP, um, they start to thaw that. Um, but the thawing process takes about 20 to 30 minutes. So there is a bit of a timing issue here. Um, and once the FFP is sent, if coagulation test results are not back, so interestingly enough, the coagulation test results also take about 20 to 30 minutes to, to do. Um, if they're not back, then the FFP is automatically sent. However, if they're back and say they're perfectly normal, then it um, may not be needed right away. So that's uh, a little bit about the speed bump, which I see as part of the trigger. Um, the treatment, as I mentioned before, is treating the bleed. And the way we treat the bleed is, of course, the basics include pressure. Um, I just want to mention IV fluids. Um, it depends on the bleed. Generally, um, giving too much fluids is not advised. Um, uh, in the past, like about 20 years ago, it was advised that giving um, crystalloids and a lot of it um, during a massive bleed was, was the standard of treatment. But it's been shown that too much fluids will dilute out um, platelets, coagulation factors, and it will also decrease the hematocrit. And you need a certain amount of hematocrit to also help stop bleeding. So um, just be wary about, uh, about that. 
And then, of course, blood products are needed. So as I mentioned, the speed bump includes um, the PAC cells and then in time, the FFP. Um, and then once the test results are available, uh, blood products can be tailored accordingly. Um, and just to mention that uh, a CBC can be done within like 10 minutes. So the results are quite quick for a CBC and we can know what the platelet count is. Um, if it's a simple bleed, generally physiologically platelet counts increase. So there may not be a need for platelets right away. However, if there is already a simultaneous coagulopathy, the platelets may be consumed and then you would need platelets right away. So that's an example of tailoring to the test results. Um, Transexamic acid is also given um, and it's shown to be effective within three hours of a critical bleed. Um, this is an antifibrinolytic, so it helps to stop the breakdown of fibrinogen. Um, as I mentioned earlier with DIC, it's both the consumption of fibrinogen as well as fibro fibrinolysis that's occurring. So a, a, a breakdown of fibrinogen, which leads to a much more acute drop in fibrinogen than other coagulation factors. And of course, um, that decrease in fibrinogen greatly exacerbates bleeding. Um, and also a reminder to reverse any anticoagulants on board. Um, the fast reversal of warfarin um, is done by a PCC, which stands for prothrombin complex. And the brand name for that is Octoplex or Baraplex. And so the approved um, indication in Canada is to reverse warfarin. It can be used for um, some of the anti um DOACs, which are direct oral anticoagulants, and their me main mechanism of action is by inhibiting mm -hmm. anti um, For anti-2A um, anticoagulants, that's dabigatran, um, there is actually now a drug available called Praxbind. It's a monoclonal antibody available through pharmacy, and that can directly reverse dabigatran. Um, and just a, again, a reminder that temperature and looking after any acidosis is um, is important uh, because they can they're part of that lethal triad which I keep mentioning. So that the lethal triad: coagulopathies, hypothermia, and acidosis. Um, so that's all part of uh, the initial treatment and the second T. The third T is testing and. The main goal of testing is to tailor treatment, and by tailoring the treatment, it, that in itself helps to max, maximize the benefit to risk ratio. And I'm, I'm just reiterating here that tailoring the products helps to reduce the risk of product wastage, as well as the risk of transfusion reactions, um, at the same time providing the appropriate needed, uh, potentially life-saving um, blood products. Um, I did mention earlier the CBC can be ready in five to ten minutes, so it's very quick. But the coagulation test, so PTT and R fibrinogen, is in 20 minutes. Um, some places, like uh, at the Moncton Hospital, we are using something called ROTEM, which stands for Rotational Thromboelastometry, um, within our MTP. ROTEMs can actually um, provide results um, much sooner and in 10 minutes. So in terms of timing, it does provide um, information about coagulopathy much, much sooner, but it is, it's a much harder um, test to interpret. But that was one of the um, renovations of our local MTPs was to incorporate ROTEMs in our MTPs uh, last year. And I, I alluded to this, but I'll mention it again because it is important. Um, platelets, Platelets are always in, in the greatest shortage, um, mainly because of its short shelf life. Its shelf life is about five to seven days because it's kept at room temperature. And in most hospitals, um, the platelets, there may be maybe uh, around three or four platelets available, so three or four doses. Um, so it's, uh, it's something that's even more limited than other blood products, and that's why tailoring the use of especially platelets is is encouraged and the CBC um, that can be obtained right away and it can also let us know what the platelet level is. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if it's a simple bleed, a simple but major bleed, so say a major 
um, lower GI bleed, for instance, without a coagulopathy, physiologically, our bodies actually increase the platelet counts. Um, so you could have a high normal to even increase platelet counts. And in that case, case um, using platelets is, is not required. So that brings me to um, basically a bleed with coagulopathy versus a bleed without coagulopathy. Um, they, they're treated differently. Um, once a coagulopathy is set in, again, clinically, you'll know it's, they, they bleed like crazy. It's very uncontrolled. Um, even the tests will verify with increased PTT, INR, decreasing fibrinogen, and, a, and a nose diving platelets. Um, so in those situations, that's when I basically teach that it's release the hounds. So we need to release as many of the blood products as possible. Um, once a person's in coagulopathy, they're going to need not just pack cells, but um, platelets, FFP, cryoprecipitate, fibrinogen. So it's basically a release the hound situation. Whereas a critical bleed without a coagulopathy, um, that is more of a tailored, more, more controlled situation. So as you can see here, our hounds are walked um, on a leash and maybe one at a time. So we would release products as needed. So um, platelets may not be needed right away, but say pack cells. So they may need four, five, six units of pack cells. Maybe that's all they'll need. Um, so this is a, a more um, breathable uh, situation where you know we do have a bit more time on our side. Um, And the other thing that uh, is often brought up when talking about MTPs is, of course, the whole one-to-one-to-one -one -one, um, concept. And I know when the MTPs first came out, um, I felt that the concept of one-to-one-to-one -one -one was pitted against the MTP and made into an artificial dichotomy. And to me, it's not really a battle of one versus another. Um, in an MTP, it is it can be incorporated, especially when, you know, I, I was mentioning a bleed with coagulopathy and we release the hounds. So releasing the hounds would be actually released in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one, um, proportion. Um, so with the MTP though, we do have now um, lab tests which are linked um, to it. So that helps to guide. Uh, so just a reminder, a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one proportion is four units of pack cells to four FFP units to one dose of platelets. And I know this can get all confusing. One dose of platelets is already four uh, donors that have been um, pooled, but at the, donor, uh, at the CVS side. Um, so they've already been pooled, and when they're shipped to the recipient hospitals, it's already in one package, and that's called one dose. So this is what the proportions are. It's supposed to um, resemble whole blood, um, so the proportions in whole blood. And yes, the military um, did use this, and they still use this concept, and, and we do too in the civilian hospitals, but the reason it's, it was used uh, more often is when there was no MTP and there was no um, accessible or available testing to be done. So sometimes we're in that situation, you know, we can have a patient come in even to the hospital and it's difficult to even get any blood work. All their, all their veins are collapsed, for instance. So that would be kind of analogous to say a military a situation where there's no readily available test results and they're bleeding like crazy. Um, that's where a one-to-one -one principle is used. So it's used when there's no test results readily available for whatever reason. But the articles that um, do talk about one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one and MTPs, they all basically um, stress that tailor once, once it is possible or if it is possible to tailor the products. So it's a, it's a more of a nuanced um, approach. Uh, this is a slide just um, detailing the link between lab results and which products to use. So I've, I've just given some examples. These are guidelines that are used in uh, most provinces. Um, I know Ontario and BC use these thresholds. So um, going back to the lab results, if a patient is 
unstable, critically bleeding, hemoglobin's less than 100, then this is where four units of PAC cells um, are given. And if platelets are less than 100 in that same critical unstable situation, it's one dose of platelets. INRs of more than 1.5, PTTs of more than 35. And again, this is the guideline um, that then uh, guides, tailors uh, in terms of using four units of FFP. Um, and then with fibrinogen, in most situations, um, it's recommended that fibrinogen, if it's less than 1.5, to then give a full dose of cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen um, concentrate. Um, in, I've mentioned less than 2.0 because that's specifically in obstetric situations. Um, with obstetric um, complications, um, there's something about the placenta that tends to trigger even more of a DIC. Um, and so it's recommended uh, to keep uh, fibrinogen levels above two. So those are just more details um, and as to how to link the specific lab results with the blood product use. And anytime we are transi transitioning from theory to practice, um, it's it's about um, well basically having uh, different tools to help implement it and sometimes that can be quite difficult. I like this quote by Dr. William Osler. It's he says to study the phenomenon of disease without books is to sail uncharted seas. Uh, with while to study books without patients is not to go to sea at all. So with the MTP. We need the clear map, which is an MTP. Um, I find also flow charts are helpful. Uh, we need our compass, which is the ethical um, principles. Um, and with the map and compass, uh, we can go out and implement um, the MTP or sail the ship. The other anal analogy I like um, when it comes to the practice of medicine or, or transitioning from theory to practice is uh, basically the analogy of being able to to dance, to go and dance, or even practice the piano. Um, I feel the practice of medicine is, is kind of analogous. Uh, we can read and write about it, but then we need to also, we, we need to practice it. Um, and it can be quite different, different in practice. Um, so sailing the ship of MTP or doing the dance of MTP, whichever analogy you like, it does require that experience and the practice. So we could have real life practice. Um, and that's that also requires a post MTP evaluation because that helps to tweak the MTPs. And it's basically reviewing you know, what worked, what worked well, um, what could be improved. Um, and so that that's important. The Ongoing discussions and education are important also, as well as simulations. So simulations are more like um, practices that don't depend on a real life situation. Um, and they can be simulate simulations in real, um, utilizing the, um, the lab as well as um, in the clinics. Uh, there are videos too uh, where you can watch simulations, so it's not uh, actual real life um, simulations. And I find um, the Ontario MTP website is very, very educational. So this is an example of one of their um, simulations. If you just Google Ontario massive transfusion uh, or massive hemorrhage uh, protocols, uh, it comes up with um, this website, which is quite extensive. So. Transitioning from theory to practice, it does, uh, experience helps a lot, um, but linking it to ethical goals and discussions and education is, is also helpful. So just a summary um, of the different tools we can use to help implement an MTP when it is activated. Um, so activated in an uncontrolled bleeding um, slash shock situation, if that is there, it could justify an MTP. Um, once it's activated, the trigger results in a speed bump of blood products. Um, then there's treat and test. Um, 
And in general, if there's a bleed and coagulopathy, it's released the hounds, so release all sorts of um, various uh, types of blood products. Or it could be a major bleed without a coagulopathy, and this will become more paced and, and more controlled and tailored. The team is very important. We are co coordinating many different departments, many different um, uh, people. Uh, so time, communication um, are absolutely key. Um, and then of course, terminating the MTP so it doesn't go on and on and on. Um, and tracking. So tracking is what I alluded to before, is um, evaluating what worked and what didn't work um, so that it could, it, there's a constant dynamic um, improvement going on. So I'm almost uh, at the end here. And as I promised, I was going to um, synthesize uh, the challenges of MTP, but linked to that, um, the concepts of just critical bleed management in general that I recently read about. So I want to summarize some of that, those concepts and some ideas. So the biggest challenges of MTP is it's time. Time, time is of essence. And to me, the, the two things that I find very difficult are the bloody FFP and bloody platelets. Um, so in terms of time, uh, thawing FFP takes 20 to 30 minutes. So, of course, this poses a big challenge. And as I mentioned before, platelets, again, in terms of their time, it's their shelf life of five to seven days and having very limited amounts um, in the hospitals. And that's just an inherent nature of the way platelets are. Uh, for, in for instance, uh, packed red cells in a big tertiary hospital, you could have maybe 30 or 40 units of pack cells as opposed to say four doses of platelets. Um, so this of course poses another challenge. And then uh, clinically it's that lethal triad, the coagulopathy, um, acidosis and hypothermia and trying to prevent it or manage these. Uh, so those are what we're dealing with. Um, and based on some of the really good questions that were um, asked after my last MTP talk in January, um, I included some of those questions and that is a segue to um, some more general concepts from my reading. Um, so there was a question about what about using factor 7a? This is a recombinant product. Um, it is an activated uh, factor. Um, it has very, very restricted use um, in, in Canada. So for instance, one of the indications is to use factor 7A for patients who are bleeding due to an autoantibody against factor 8. So that's also known as an inhibitor against factor 8, a really rare situation. But uh, 7A does, it can be approved for certain off-label uses. Um, in the setting of trauma, so uh, I read that you know the military did uh, try and use that in this, I believe it was the Iraq um, wars, um, and it's it can be effective um, in stopping the bleeds, but there are a few drawbacks. So uh, further studies showed that factor 7A once coagulopathy sets in, it's not effective, um, and so. It's, it's a bit tricky because you want to have certain elements already present. You need platelets and coagulation factors already there for 7A to be, to be truly effective. The other thing is there's a, there is a small risk of thrombosis, um, and especially if a person has predisposition. So if they have atherosclerosis, if they have liver disease, they're at increased risk of um, clotting, and not clotting in the place where you want to stop the bleed, of course, it's clotting in places you don't want it to occur. So heart attacks, um, strokes, et cetera. Um, so clotting in the wrong places. And as I mentioned, um, the US military had been using that in certain wars. I believe it was the Iraq one. Um, and just a reminder though, that the health of the military is, is generally better than of the general population. 
And so I would suspect that the risk of thrombosis would be something um, higher given that the general population has more atherosclerosis and um, other predispositions to clotting. So it is basically a product that I think should remain off-label, meaning you can use it in situ certain situations of critical um, bleeds, and I have um, advised for certain off-label uses, but it's not, um, it's not that often. Um, but it shouldn't be part of a wide sweeping protocol at this time. But to be able to address these challenges up here, so FFP and platelets, so there's, there's then the question of freeze-dried plasma. Now, this is actually um, a product that's different than fractionated lyophilized products that we already have. Um, so fractionated lyophilized is just another word for dried products. Um, examples of those are fibrinogen concentrate as well as PCC, the prothrombin complex that we use to um, quickly reverse warfarin and anti 10 a um, anticoagulants. Um, so this requires actually quite a sophisticated process of selecting a specific protein, say fibrinogen, from plasma and then drying it. Um, and so it's, it's a lot more complicated process than a freeze-dried plasma. Freeze-dried plasma was actually developed in World War II. Um, and it basically has all the proteins in plasma. So immunoglobulins, coagulation factors, albumin, et cetera. It's, there, there's no selection of the protein um, and it's dried. And then it could be reconstituted and used, um, say, during a critical bleed. So I thought that was quite quite interesting. Um, and in fact, it's approved for production um, only in a few places. So in France, Germany, and South Africa, um, it's not approved for production or use in Canada or the States right now. Um, but I, I believe um, this has a lot of potential um, for use in a critical bleeds uh, situation, mainly because of the timing. Um, Instead of thawing for 20 to 30 minutes, it could be available right away. Um, so it has been revived in these countries. It is being produced. Um, so I think this has potential, but it could be, you know, years down the ro road um, for North America to be uh, producing um, and using it if it, if this is a route that uh, we choose to go. So that that does have potential. Um, there was another question about whole blood. Uh, this, is, this is a very interesting um, area because currently um, whole blood is being used um, for civilian traumas in the United States. It is also being used in the military, uh, the US military. Uh, so there was a question of, well, why can't we use it here in Canada? And uh, there are a lot of studies showing that whole blood use, it, originally was used in World War I, and then in World War II, um, it continued, as I mentioned, it continues to be used in the military. So uh, there's more and more studies showing uh, that it is very effective, especially if it's used in field at the moment of trauma. So there's a timing issue too. However, in Canada right now, it's not even being produced. So it's not produced by C CBS um, or Hema Quebec. So those are our donor sites, and uh, they are both of them are excellent in um, selecting um, and recruiting donors, uh, making some of the products, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when I looked into this more, it's basically the bottom line. It's just a practical logistic nightmare to even think about starting to produce whole blood um, in Canada. Uh, there's also a lot of wastage of this product because it can it's indicated mainly and only in a critical bleed situation. Um, and in fact, I did see that in the US, in the civilian hospitals, in fact, there's a lot of wastage. And remember, I was saying one of the ethical principles is to try and um, be responsible to the donors who are taking the time um, and resources to be able to donate this very precious resource. Um, it's whole blood, unlike component blood, it just it can't be redirected and used for other situations. Um, then there's of course the risk of hemolysis um, in the general uh, population. 
And in hospital, if you're able to test and find any underlying allo antibodies, it helps for just more um, quality treatment and, and provision of blood products um, so that we're not on top of a bleed giving them um, hemolysis. So there, there's all sorts of um, mainly practical and logistic reasons why this is not available in, in Canada. Um, but I do recognize that there's more, it's been resurrected and being used uh, because, it, especially for in-field treatment of critical bleeds, it's very, very effective, much more effective than just giving um, IV fluids on the spot. As I mentioned before, giving too much fluids will dilute out platelets, coagulation factors, and the hematocrit. Um, so it's that infield treatment. So even in the military, there they do have um, you know the portable um, mash units, well the, the 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 portable hospitals essentially. But even if somebody was critically injured uh, somewhere else, they still have to bring them to that hospital. And, uh, and so they're looking at that whole um, idea of infield treatment. So it's being able to provide that whole blood at the moment of crisis. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, being a problem solver and creative and mulling over all these challenges, um, this, is, this is just a, it's a hypothetical, um, possible solution. And in fact, there's parts of Canada, um, I just learned new, um, Nova Scotia is, is doing a part of this already. But basically, uh, the challenge and this hypothetical solution is to try and provide timely life-saving treatment, but also address certain ethics. So what is the ethics? It's basically balancing providing efficacious products to the patient. So we want something that's actually useful for the and beneficial for the patients, but safe. So we want safe products and we want to minimize the risks to the patients. So those risks are risks of thrombosis, um, risks of hemolysis, um, and the risk of producing shortage of products that could be available for other patients. We also want to be responsible and reduce risks for the donors involved. So there's a, this is a big balancing act. Um, but at the same time, knowing medically that in-field treatment with whole blood is extremely effective, and that is an ideal goal. However, practically speaking, a lot of different um, aspects to look at, and also ethically speaking, a lot of different aspects. But hypothetically, I was thinking if we had an infield whole blood-like substitute that we can give right at that moment, so it would be carried by, say, ground transport um, or helicopters or planes, um, and amalgamate it with an MTP. So once at the hospital, if needed, an MTP can be triggered, or instead of an MTP, a tailored treatment, meaning um, certain tests could be asked for. So a group and screen, for, for instance, would be done right away to uh, make sure there's no allo antibodies present, for instance, and that they don't have some really rare uh, blood group that uh, require, requires uh, more specialized products. So it's the amalgamation of both. And I, I know um, in Alberta, they're already trying um, to have in-field uh, blood products available. So this is what I mean, that part of it is being used. Um, when I mean parts, they're looking at, you know, transporting red cells and platelets in field to the point of trauma. Um, and what I'm referring to is actually having a whole blood-like substitute. So whole blood, um, it has the plasma component, red cells and platelets. Um, the, to make whole blood out of the different components available, this is what I kind of am theoretically proposing. So keep in mind, this is all still hypothetical. Um, and I am um, teaming with our New Brunswick um, trauma um, committee to look more closely into different aspects of this. Um, so the plasma component, um, it's basically the coagulation factors that we need to provide. And as I mentioned, FFP right now, you need to thaw it. It's, um, there's, there's all sorts of practical um, considerations there. But I was thinking we have fractionated dried products available. We have fibrinogen now, and 
it can it has a shelf life of one to two years and it can uh, conceivably be uh, transported um, in a plane, in a helicopter, in a ground transport, and used in situations of a critical uncontrolled bleeding. You assume there's, you know, DIC, and you can give this fibrinogen. And in fact, I found out that the Canadian Special Arm, uh, no, Special Operations uh, Forces do have fibrinogen on board for those critical situations, in addition to transoxemic acid. So transoxemic acid is your antifibrinolytic plus fibrinogen. Then I was thinking, well, what about PCCs? That's the prothrombin complex. And it includes vitamin D, uh, I mean, vitamin K dependent factors, um, factors 10, 9, 7, 2, protein CNS. Um, the indi approved indication in Canada is for re quick reversal of warfarin, um, and it can be used to reverse anti 10 A anticoagulants. However, in Europe, they do use PCC as a plasma substitute in non trauma conditions. But there are articles now exploring using PCC in trauma conditions. Um, and so I think this does have um, potential to be used, but specifically in a in a in-field critical bleeding um, situation. Um, PCC doesn't have activated factors like 7A. 7A is, is activated, so there is theoretically more risk of thrombosis there. So that's one concept. Then there are the fresh products being used. Um, and I was just informed that Nova Scotia um, is doing infield treatments with red cells. Um, in Alberta, I believe it's red cells and platelets uh, that they are transporting. Um, it would be unmatched um, group O, RH negative, RH positive um, red cells. Now, the reason we uh, in New Brunswick can't do this right away is because we only have coolers. And um, to make sure that these fresh products are safe for the patient, um, they not only have to be mobile, but they need to have temperature control in them. And um, also, in case these products aren't used, if they're in a tem temperature controlled environment and not used, they could be brought back and then used for another patient, for instance. So it would also help to decrease wastage. But definitely finding units that are temperature controlled and we can do quality control remotely, um, that uh, is, makes it uh, certainly viable. Um, platelets, uh, as I had mentioned, um, they are still always in the shortage, which is shelf life of five to seven days. Um, so keeping that in mind, but the thing about transporting them, they are, trans, they are in room temperature and agitated. So generally platelets aren't transported because of that reason. However, I did find out you can cool pet platelets to a certain temperature and it actually, that cooling increases its function. However, it decreases its in vivo uh, lifespan. So once it's in the patient, it's, those platelets are removed fast. However, they have increased functioning. So in, in fact, in a trauma situation, uh, in a acute bleed, this could be um, basically a way to transport platelets. I'm thinking in the near future, I would love if there was an inventory of platelets that were actually um, uh, made and uh, stored in cool temperatures right from production. So there would be kind of two inventories, one of temperature controlled, I mean, uh, room temperature platelets and one inventory of cooled platelets. The cooled platelets, of course, would have a decreased in vivo life, but they would have actually a shelf life of about 20 days. So to me, that would be, oh, it would be such a blessing and it would help um, not just in MTPs, but just in platelet usage in general. So the, for instance, the room temperature ones with a shelf life of five to seven days, um, they have a, a longer in vivo life. So those platelets could be used for prophylaxis. Um, so patients on chemotherapy and they have low platelets, um, they could be used for prophylaxis so that they have you know a, a longer in vivo life. Whereas the cooled platelets could be reserved for uh, critical bleeds. Anyways, uh, I'm not sure what, time it is, but I think we have um, a few minutes for, for questions. Yep, I have a couple questions here for you. Um, 
With the UK Rep Hill trial, they looked at metabolic derangements of patriot blood cells, i.e. one six-day-old unit has greater than 20K. The trend to change the triad to coags, hypercal, or hypocal. Your thoughts? It's a good question. And basically, the biochemical changes that occur with um, the storage of red cells, uh, that's termed a storage lesion. Um, so the longer they're stored, the more um, of these biochemical changes. As you mentioned, there's um, more leakage of uh, potassium, for instance. Um, there are other, other changes too. Um, studies have shown that even with a storage lesion occurring, um, the safe duration of time for red cells um, is 42 days. Um, and after that, they're, they're outdated. Um, so the storage les lesion for um, basically non-babies is, is still safe to use and um, not, not really a, um, a risk or concerned um, with uh, the, the massive transfusion. Um, so that's, that's basically, I think, uh, I think what you're, what you're asking, and I'm hoping that I'm um, addressing it. Uh, so the, it, it is safe within the MTPs. And I say non-babies because babies, babies have a very, very, very tiny um, blood volume. So any amounts of potassium, um, citrate, et cetera, can, can affect them. So it's a um, standard of care to try and give them as fresh as possible pack cells. So it's usually like um, no older than seven to 10 days. But older than that, we can we take those um, storage lesions. Hey, Dr. Mana, if you don't mind, I reached out to um, a member of our Life Flight Critical Care Transport team as well. Just while we have some people online across the province, I just asked, see if I can unmute him second. Um, oh, sorry. Just trying to see if I can get Steve Crocker. Um, just because the next comment kind of relates to our transport as well. Okay. Are you there, Steve? Okay, I'm just going to read the next comment because it kind of ties into some of the, the end of your last slide. Um, it says, I just moved from miss, just moved to Nova Scotia from BC and I was carrying red blood cells in a cooler on an air ambulance with 48 hour return to blood bank for redistribution, redistribution if not used. So I just asked if Steve could kind of comment since we do have people from around the province online, just kind of what our capabilities are with our life flight critical care transport team. I'm not sure that everybody is aware of what they have on board and what they're able to give en route. So if you wanna just take a minute, Steve. Sure, thanks, Andrea. Uh, so yeah, about three years ago, we introduced the transfusion program at LifeLight, and we currently carry two units of O-negative blood. Um, yep. They're they're carried in a cre it's called a Credo box. Yes. So it's a, it's a cooler type box. Uh, that's sort of managed through trans transfusion services at the QE2, and so we get that blood. Uh, we have two boxes, one for our, our sort of peak team and one for our core team. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we have that we have that blood, and it gets switched out every 48 hours. So if it's not used, it it goes back every 48 hours, and we get a new uh, cooler box. For us. Okay. Okay. So and so the coolers is are they ice packs or it, like is it um, like a fridge where it's temperature controlled, or it's just kind of. Um, more like um, ice packs and then the temperature would have to be taken um, in the blood bank. So it, it's monitored through the blood bank. And so this credo box has kind of hard to, to explain, but it sort of has, it's lined with these sort of cooling elements. And so mm -hmm. when it's packaged in those boxes, uh, we use a temperature logger that's, right. uh, that, that's put into these blood boxes. And that temperature logger, when we open up that blood box, it's either a check mark or an X. And so if okay. it's a check mark, then that blood is within the, the temperature regulations that we need to use it, so we'll use it. And if it's an X, we, we won't use it. 
We just right. recently, those temperature loggers, we just recently found out that we could use it through Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. We can actually, we can actually take our phone, uh, Bluetooth it to the temperature logger inside the box. So we know that, you know, at the beginning of our shift, when we have a, a new box, when we, when we do our either morning or evening check, we mm -hmm. know that that blood, we know that that blood is within the temperature, uh, temperature numbers that we need. And if and it's outside, then we would send that blood back to, to transfusion services and get a new, get a new box. Right. Yeah. No, that's great to hear. And um, with the red cells, it's important to have it at the right temperature. And it's a very, it's a narrow range, as, as you know. Um, uh, mainly um, to make sure that it's actually effective, so that they're they're they work and they function well. Um, it and it's also to make sure that you know they don't hemolyze because then it becomes unsafe for the patient. Et cetera. So there's a lot of tight regulations for that temperature aspect. So um, I'm I'm thrilled to hear that you, you guys are. Um, already doing that. I would like to see something like that for New Brunswick. Um, but what we're doing in, um, in New Brunswick, um, first and foremost, is the New Brunswick trauma train is just assessing the whole landscape of um, uh, critical traumas, meaning the time it takes uh, to bring the patients into hospital, um, what the needs are for in-field treatment. Um, so we're, we need to do that first to figure out the needs. I have a feeling because, you know, all of Canada is a big country and it's, it's so spread out, you know, um, there's a lot of remote places in, in every province. Um, so I, I feel that there will be a need, but that's our first step. Um, then what I'd like to see is um, availability of these, um, products so that it it mimics um, kind of that full, full blood concept um, so have various components of it uh, available so that it can be used in in field so yeah yeah, yeah no it's uh, it's it's been successful for our program uh, over the last few years and now in 2021 I think we we've uh, instituted our blood program about 50 times on 50 missions that we've used our blood. So that's a mixture of scene missions, so trauma scene missions, as well as interfacility missions uh, from hospital to hospital. That's excellent to hear. And we may need to reach out and, and uh, find out details um, as, as we um, go forward here in New Brunswick, you know, in, in terms of uh, the, the coolers you're using and et cetera, yep. et cetera. So, yeah, absolutely. So reinventing the the wheel but uh no I'm, I'm very very heartened to hear that um i'm also um hoping to have um fibrinogen and uh, the pcc on on board and as i mentioned in my presentation like it's it's all still quite hypothetical um and the concept is to be able to have a whole blood like um treatment or products available um so putting together, you know, the coagulation factors, which would be through fibrin mm -hmm. and, and prothrombin complex, but then together with red cells and then possibly with the platelets too. So yeah, we would we would like to pick your brain on what, what else we could carry for our program along with our uh, O negative blood. Yeah, and I think that the fibrinogen definitely is something that uh, is, doable, um, both from the logistic and medical standpoint. And as I mentioned, um, it, I found that the Canadian Special Operations um, Unit, they actually have fibrinogen that on board for critical bleeds. So another place to kind of reach out to. Um, yeah, so yes, we can, uh, we should definitely collaborate and um, move forward from there. Great, thank you. Most welcome. Thanks for jumping in there, Steve. Um, I don't have any other I don't have any other questions for Dr. Mana at this time. Um, thank you very much for a very informative presentation today. We appreciate your time and your support of our program. And again, thanks to Steve for just kind of jumping in on the spot. I was texting him while you were talking. <laughs> okay. No, that was great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everybody. And um, as I mentioned in my earlier slide here. Um, 
a lot of various mentors and and healthcare staff um, through different provinces. Um, these are the specific uh, hospitals and locations um, uh, that helped me to learn quite a bit um, about transfusion practices, but MTPs um, in general, and as well as my own experiences um, implementing MTPs and being on call for, for MTPs. So thank you to everybody and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. You too. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. My pleasure. Bye.